Welcome to this week's episode of the Monocle Banking Podcast, brought to you by Monocle Solutions. Well, today we're really honored to host a very special guest, uh, Sabia Mohammed, the CEO of the newly launched Corporation for Deposit Insurance, or CODI for short, a pivotal addition to South Africa's financial sector safety net. In today's episode, we're going to uncover the layers behind CODI's establishment. Uh, we'll have a look at its critical role in bolstering trust and confidence within South Africa's banking system. And we'll also discuss why Cody was needed, some of the challenges that were faced in designing an effective framework and the strategic milestones achieved along the way. Throughout our discussion, we'll also find out how Cody operates, its funding mechanisms and how it fits into the broader landscape of South Africa's regulatory reforms post the 2008 global financial crisis and also since the collapse and looting of VBS. So grab your coffee and let's get into the intricacies of South Africa's financial safeguards with Sabina Mohammed. You're listening to the Monocle Banking Podcast, and we're just getting started. Sabia, it's wonderful to have you with us today. The launch of Cody marking a quite significant advancement for financial stability in South Africa. But before we get stuck into the nuts and bolts of Cody. You've been with the Saab since 2001, so fair to say you're something of a policy mandarin of sorts. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Thank you, Michael. Um, yes, I have been with the South African Reserve Bank for quite a number of years. I started as a graduate um, and then I moved into the what was then called the Bank Supervision Department, where I was for about 13 years, um, focusing specifically on the bank supervision and regulation of some of the banks. So did a variety of banks from small to large. From there, I moved on to financial stability, where I worked on bank recovery plans as well as deposit insurance. So since then, with Cody's establishment and becoming a department within the SOAP, I've just moved to focus only on deposit insurance. And that means you were part of the team that was really instrumental in developing the, the legislation, the underpins for Cody to become a legal entity back in 2023. And I believe now as CEO, you're obviously going to be leading the team to ensure that Cody is fully operational. It became operational, in fact, on the 1st of April, and that's no April fool's joke. Let, let's just start by understanding the genesis of Cody, because I think, as far as I understand it, we are the last of the G20 countries to introduce this kind of deposit insurance. So take us back to the genesis. <laughs> yes, so when I joined the Financial Stability Department in 2013, um, doing the research on deposit insurance and what it would look like for South Africa was one of my first tasks. At that point, um, there were three G20 countries that did not have a deposit insurance scheme, and it was us, China, and Saudi Arabia. Um, so in 2015, I think both of them implemented an explicit deposit insurance scheme, leaving South Africa to be the last. So what the work involved was basically, it was part of the Twin Peaks framework that National Treasury announced, I think it was in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. We, we started off with doing surveys just to see what the deposits looked like at the, the banks that we had in South Africa. And based on that, we had to make um, certain policy proposals. So this led to the publication of the very first deposit insurance discussion paper in 2017, which just outlined the design features, the initial ones. At that time, we also started working on the legislative framework, the Financial Sector Laws Amendment, what is now called the Financial Sector Laws Amendment Act. Way back, it was called the Special Resolutions Bill. So a lot of things happened at once. So the legislation, the primary legislation was completed and then submitted to Parliament. And while that was happening, we also started publishing a variety of discussion papers outlining how Cody will eventually operate. So I think we've published about seven discussion papers and the specific purpose of that was to, to consult with the banking sector as well as the public and then to use the feedback that we received to make things better and to refine some of the proposals. And while doing that, we also drafted the secondary legislation. So Cody has ministerial regulations and then it also has a prudential standard for one of the funding components. Yes, and then the final legislation went through just before April this year to enable Cody to become operational then. So it's been quite a journey, mm, lots mm. of collaboration with the banking sector, as well as with international stakeholders such as the World Bank. So it's it's been an involved process. Uh, yeah, I think to put it mildly, um, having read through uh, at least some of the discussion papers, the, the, the tomes of it show that the was extensive consultation with the industry, with stakeholders. And 
I mean, one might question what the delays were, but equally one could also say that sometimes with these things you, you can build in by being a follower some of the lessons learned in other countries. So maybe just on that point, what were the reason, reasons maybe for some of the, the delays in, in us being the last of the G20 countries to introduce this? And was VBS, for example, an inspiration to get this really up and running following uh, what happened there with uh, depositors uh, so negatively impacted? So I think if you listen to the launch, you would hear that the governors speak about the work initially started many, many years ago, but it was never fulfilled or it didn't come to fruition. Um, so, but with the global financial crisis, there was almost a re-look internationally at how banks and other financial institutions should be handled when they fail, specifically the too big to fail institutions. But as part of that, there was also a bit of a shift in terms of a deposit insurance framework. So in the past, the deposit insurer only reimbursed depositors, but there was a change in the mandate of a deposit insurer to also include other functions, which is now what Cody has. So Cody has a pay box plus mandate. So it means that we can either reimburse depositors of a banking resolution, but we can also provide funding, a guarantee or enter into a loss sharing agreement. But ultimately, the South African Reserve Bank is the resolution authority and they choose the strategy. Cody just fulfills a small portion of that strategy with funding or then one of these other mechanisms. So that is where it started. So this was about 2012, around about there. So I, I, I think... By the time that VBS happened, a lot of this work had already been underway. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's not that it was delayed. I think it was just, it was such an extensive consultation process that we followed. And one of the items that you earlier mentioned that we'll touch on is the funding model. So that was one of the items that we probably consulted on more than anything else with the banks. Because the initial funding model that we published in 2017 was quite expensive for the banks. So in collaboration with them, we then had to refine the funding model into what it is today. So I wouldn't say delays. I think it was just a lengthy process that we had to go through. In that good South African tradition of consensus seeking and George or being much better than war war, one might say. Okay, let's talk about the funding. Can you explain? You've got a tiered funding model that's been adopted for Cody. How does each tier function and what are their specific purposes here? Sure. So let's start with the operational costs. The banks will pay to Cody a deposit insurance levy for Cody's operational costs. It is a very small levy and we were able to keep it that small specifically because the South African Reserve Bank um, is providing Cody with all of its support services. So it won't cost us as much as if we had to do those functions ourselves. I don't know if the listeners would be interested in the exact percentages, but it's 0.0125% of cover deposits. And this is payable once a year. So I think another thing of the funding model to remember is that all of the bank's contributions to Cody would be based on their cover deposits. So cover deposits is the amount to which Cody protects their qualifying depositors. So they're only paying for the insured portion of their deposits. So that was another mechanism that we brought in so that you pay for what you get essentially. If we then look at the other funding tiers, the deposit insurance fund itself which can only be used for bank resolution purposes when a bank has failed, consists of two portions. Um, the one is the premium that banks will pay to Cody, which is monthly. It is 0.2% of cover deposits divided by 12. So this is an expense for the banks and it will be paid to Cody. Cody will invest this funds and any interest that it earns on this will be Cody's. The bigger portion of the deposit insurance fund is um, what is a loan from the banks to Cody. So Cody will invest this loan and it will earn interest. A portion of that interest will go back to the banks. Uh -huh. And the specific purpose of this was to reduce the cost of deposit insurance. So they keep an asset on their balance sheet. It is also guaranteed by the South African Reserve Bank. So in terms of reporting to the Prudential Authority, it's got a zero risk weighted allocation. So we've made it as, as affordable as we could. And I think the whole funding model was just designed in collaboration with the banks to make sure that we reduce the costs as much as we can. And then the last layer of funding that we have is the South African Reserve Bank providing us with the emergency funding if we need it. Um, so it's there as a, a backstop, but we don't think we would easily need to use it because the funding model should be sufficient for, for most of the transactions Cody would have to support. So that is in a nutshell just an overview of the entire funding model. Yeah, well, you summed that up beautifully because it is a, quite technical and it has lots of nuances. And I, I guess this is where, as you said, a lot of the discussions uh, over the last few years have really centered 
When it comes to how that kitty is managed, and, and you said the interest is to some extent on that loan going to be used to help reduce the cost of cover, will that then be reviewed on an annual basis as to how that fund has performed and there's a review on costs moving forward? How will that work? So each year, Cody's board will assess the adequacy of the deposit insurance fund and we would then have to decide, do we keep that loan at the amount or the percentage that it is, because currently it will be 3% of cover deposits of a bank, or do we adjust it? So in terms of the legislation, we can make it anything from between 0 and 3.5%, depending on what Cody's specific needs for the next year would be. So obviously the interest and the performance will determine what, what will be there at the end of the year when we do the assessment. The idea is not to build this fund forever, We've got a target that we've set, which will also be assessed annually by the board. And once we reach the target, then we will start to reduce the contributions from the banks. We're also looking at almost reducing the composition of the deposit insurance fund over time. So at the moment, the loan is the biggest portion. And we're looking at decreasing that every year, if possible, just to make it a little bit more affordable, but also not to have this continuous building up of funds. And there's a, an emergency funding facility that will be provided by the Saab. Under what circumstances would this be utilised and what are the terms of, of the emergency support? So I cannot share all of that, um, but essentially it's there if the deposit insurance fund is insufficient. So say a number of larger banks fail, deposit insurance fund may not be sufficient, but then the SARP will step in with the additional funding that we need. So if we do utilize that facility, we first have to repay the South African Reserve Bank. Um, But I think another change that the law brought in the legislative changes was it changed the credit hierarchy when a bank goes into resolution. Um, So Cover deposits will now be just after the concurrent creditors. And Cody, if it uh, facilitates a, a reimbursement, for example, or supports another type of resolution strategy, will then take the place of the cover deposits in that hierarchy. So it means that in most cases, because we've got that higher level or higher ranking, we should be able to recover most of the funds. Mm-hmm. Um, so that will then be utilized to first repay the SOAP if we use them, otherwise to, to rebuild the deposit insurance fund itself. And uh, Cody covers up to 100,000 rand per depositor per bank. Uh, How was this coverage limit determined? And do you believe it adequately protects the most vulnerable in such an unequal society? Because obviously very high net worth depositors might look at that and say it's insufficient. But if you're, you know, in in the majority, which is uh, in the lower income brackets in South Africa, that that would seem more than sufficient. Yes, so I think that's another reason why this process took so long. We did multiple surveys. I think we did three surveys just to see what the deposits at the banks looked like, what were the sizes and the distribution of that between the different types of depositors. So when we did our last survey, it just almost confirmed that 100,000 rand per qualifying depositor per bank would be sufficient. At that amount... I want to say nine out of 10 qualifying depositors are fully covered. So that means that nine out of 10 depositors in South Africa have less than 100,000 rand in the bank. Based on the survey, in actual fact, I think it was 85% of the qualifying depositors had deposits of less than 10,000. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty shocking and hopefully the numbers will improve over time. But we felt that making it 100,000 will reduce even for those with slightly larger deposits, you know, the the anxiety if their bank were to fail that there would be sufficient coverage for them. So we also looked at if we were to increase the level slightly to 150 or 200,000 per qualifying depositor, what would the impact be? But because there are so few depositors with balances above the 100,000, it's it's very little the impact. It's like 0.1% increase in the number of depositors that you would actually protect then. But I think it's also important to understand that of the qualifying depositors, everyone is covered. It's just that they're not fully covered. Um, so for those that would then have balances above the 100,000, they would get the 100,000 if their bank failed, and the remainder would remain in the estate of the failed bank to be handled by the liquidator in line with the credit hierarchy. Mm, very interesting. And I, I know one of the big challenges that has been discussed at length in other markets around introducing some kind of depositor insurance is moral hazard. And one doesn't want to incentivize excessive risk taking and, you know, encourage that kind of behavior in uh, in the banking system. I guess the question, therefore, is are well-managed banks having to protect the consumers of not well-managed banks? 
I think it's important to remember that this is a financial system. Um, so everything is interrelated and work together. So Kauri by itself, I don't think causes moral hazard or causes any of those consequences. We've got the prudential authority that looks at how banks manage themselves and their risks. Um, we've got the financial conduct authority that looks at the fair treatment of customers. So all of this work together to, to contain the moral hazard. We also feel that by having a 100,000 limit in terms of coverage, it does not cover everyone. So those people with the larger balances or the depositors that don't qualify would have to still apply risk management for themselves and, and make the decisions as to where their money would be the safest. Mm. So it's kind of a, a balancing act. We, we do have coverage. We're not fully covering everyone. So there's still a level of discretion with the depositors as well as with the banks as to how they manage their risks. Mm. Speaking uh, to the bank's balance sheet, how does the funding model affect the bank's financial statements, uh, particularly concerning the accounting of contributions to Cody as assets? Yes, so that was something that took a lot of work from our side. So we did um, get, what shall I call it, accounting opinions from auditors just to make sure that the way that we've structured this funding model will actually result in the best outcome for the banks. So the levy and the premium would be expenses through the income statement, but they're tiny amounts. The loan itself has been confirmed to be an asset on the balance sheet of the banks. And because of that, we also had to look at this should be a minimum return um, because banks would have to earn more or less what they would have earned if they gave that money to someone else as a loan. So these were all the considerations that we had to, to look at in finalizing the funding model. Very interesting. And when we look at this uh, from a global best practice perspective, how does this align with international standards and best practices such as those set by the International Association for Deposit Insurers? So are you talking specifically the funding model or generally? Well, the funding model to some extent, I know there, there are local nuances, but generally have we followed global best practice here? Yes, so IADI or the International Association of Deposit Insurers require that the deposit insurance scheme must be funded by the banks. Um, so we're totally following that. So it has to be funded by the banks and our mechanism is slightly different from most countries because they would just use a premium, whereas we've got the, the loan as well. But essentially we're complying because it's, it's a funded by the banking sector then as a whole. When In terms you... of other IARI requirements, we, yes. we, we aim to comply with everything. So there's obviously transitional arrangements in some regards, um, but we try to follow as closely as we can the principles set out by IARI. And IARI is currently reviewing their core principles. Um, and when they do publish the updated version, we will just make an assessment to see if there are any gaps and what do we need to do to become fully compliant. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I guess the... You know, the fund is obviously going to be managed in such a way as to bring down the operational costs and be efficient. How are these costs factored into the funding model and what is the impact on Cody's operational costs on the levies collected from member banks? At the moment, and the law is very clear, the levies are completely separate from the deposit insurance fund. So at the end of the year, if there's any money left from the levies that Cody has collected, it's transferred to the deposit insurance fund. It cannot go the other way around. So I think in terms of the levies, we've considered what the cost will be for Cody in terms of the different components of its operational costs, and it should be sufficient. Um, but we do have an annual process of looking at at the levy percentage through the parliamentary budgeting process for regulatory authorities. So if need be, we can also make adjustments in that regard. Um, but the intention has never been to make it excessively high. We'll keep it as low as we can mm. um, to just to ensure that the impact on the banks is as minimal as we can manage. Yeah, I mean, that said, it, it's still a huge undertaking that will require investments in big data, for example. You mentioned that the funding model will be subject to review and adjustment based on empirical data. So what do you see as the big data challenges that, uh, Sabir, you've had to now overcome in order to ensure that you can roll this out and, and ensure that you've got the, the right data to trigger these reviews? 
Uh, so data is such an important component of a deposit insurance scheme. Um, so Cody is at the moment busy with the systems development process. So from the 1st of April, banks were submitting aggregated balances to Cody for us to be able to calculate the financial contributions that the banks would have to make to Cody. We are busy with developing a system where banks would submit much more information to Cody, which we would call single customer view information. Um, so that would be information on specifically the depositors with the accounts and qualifying products, because that is what we will then use if we have to support the resolution. Um, so this will take us until next year, October, I think. So that is in terms of the operational aspects and the resolution support, which is our mandate. But there are also other, I mean, you mentioned the funding model. So in terms of the investment of the funds, um, the South African Reserve Bank's Financial Markets Department is managing it for Cody, um, and they're also busy appointing external fund managers to ensure that we can maximize the return on this money within the investment guidelines. So. At the moment, we're using an interim investment option, but as soon as the external fund managers are in place, that will also slightly change. And then also, you know, the performance management would also be affected by that, which will also have data implications. So it's a journey of constant improvement and looking at where's the gaps and how do we address those gaps. And I yeah. think it will take us a couple of years to well, maybe get to an end point and then the end point will probably be fluctuating depending on the specific <laughs> requirements as well. So, yeah, it's a significant and involved journey in terms of the data specifically. Yeah, as data journeys so often are, but especially when you're dealing with something as systemically important as providing a depositor insurance in Africa's most advanced financial economy. I want to come back to coverage. Obviously, depositors at traditional banks are covered. Yeah, are all banks, mutual banks, are stock files covered, for example, and, and vulnerable groups in other more informal systems, or is that maybe in a phase two? Yes, yeah, so if you look at the Cody member banks at the moment, it will be the commercial banks, the uh, cooperative banks, mutual banks, and then the local branches of foreign banks. We do cover stock files. Um, they are depositors at these banks. We call them informal beneficiary accounts because we also have formal beneficiary accounts. They're called informal beneficiary accounts because the record keeping of stock files are generally done by the members themselves. So it's not done in terms of uh, law. Whereas with the formal beneficiary accounts, the law requires, the Financial Intelligence Centre Act requires that the account holder have complies with specific formal record keeping practices. So with the informal beneficiary accounts or the stock files, that is not applicable. So what it means is that we cover informal beneficiaries up to 100,000 for all the accounts held in that name. So if a stock file has five savings deposits, we would consolidate the balance and they would be covered up to 100,000 for the stock file. We also have in law that if the bank collects the details of each of the members of the stock file, then it would be seen as a formal beneficiary account because the bank is then the record keeper. And then we can provide each member up to 100,000 rand um, for their balances and qualifying accounts. It's an important and distinction, yeah. It is. And I think especially with the newer banks that have indicated to us that they are setting up their stock file accounts to collect that types of information. With some of the older banks, that is something that they probably would have to look at going forward. Mm, and uh, I, I guess a big opportunity here for banks as well to further cement and uh, build trust with the so-called informal market. Because often when I've uh, spoken to Stockfell members, the reason they prefer Stockfells as to going into any other more traditional products is a lack of trust for whatever that reason is. Which I guess brings me to my question around depositor awareness. And uh, clearly, you've launched and you're talking to the market, you're preaching to the choir, so to speak. What are you doing to increase depositor awareness about the benefits and maybe some of the limitations of Cody's protection? Because that's obviously crucial. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at Cody's mandate, which is prescribed in law, um, our second mandate is to make sure that the public is aware of Cody and its depositor protection, as well as the benefits and limitations. So it's something that we take very seriously. With the launch that happened on the 25th of April, we also launched a public awareness campaign in collaboration with our member banks. And the focus of that is really to make sure that there is uh, that we promote awareness of depositor protection with its benefits and limitations in South Africa. 
So Kali itself will engage in several activities and initiatives such as doing these interviews. We've got a web page that's got frequently asked questions for the public. I think it's quite informative and I would recommend anyone go and have a look at the website. And then we also have, in terms of the law, we've put certain obligations on banks to communicate about deposit protection. So annually banks would have to train their staff, the deals with customers, to be able to convey the message of deposit insurance to their depositors. We also found that when, it, when we did a benchmark study in 2019, depositors prefer hearing about financial products from their banks. So that is why we've entered into this collaboration with the banks, because they know their depositors and they know how best to communicate with them. So Cody has also developed public awareness materials, which we've given to the banks. So they have a choice between digital as well as physical materials, which they can then distribute to their depositors in the way that they think is best. And I think we've given them a choice between one of the two, but the more they want to do the better also for Cody. And I think they also have to indicate to the depositors which of their products qualify for depositor protection. Yeah, um, yeah. So obviously this will take a while to settle, but these are some of the requirements that we've implemented to make sure that this is something that receives focus from the banks as well. On that note, c can you just maybe explain the criteria for a banking product to qualify for Cody protection? Uh, how do these criteria align with the financial habits and the needs of South Africans? Yes, so if we look at which depositors do Cody cover, we cover individuals and non-financial businesses. So you will see that we've excluded government financial depositors because those are the ones that are financially sophisticated. They know about mitigation and, you know, all of the different mechanisms that they could implement or hedging, you know, to manage their money safely. So the focus is really on those depositors that would put their money in the bank for safekeeping. Um, they're not too concerned about earning as much as they can. It's there for safekeeping. So they typically would put their money in the bank in terms of a deposit product where the return is guaranteed and where the balance is not affected by share movement or a unit trust or anything like that. So we cover deposit products, which include savings accounts, fixed and notes, transactional accounts, check accounts, those types of products. Very important to, to understand that for depositors as well. Again, I think a big opportunity uh, for the banks to communicate. And, uh, you know, banks will obviously communicate and try and sell their own products and services as the best in the market. Uh, but, you know, that's shared value. That's a win-win for you at the end of the day. So, Bia, just as uh, we're running out of time, just lastly, as Cody also supports various resolution strategies, how do you collaborate with the South African Reserve Bank in its role as the resolution authority? And how does this play into South Africa's broader resolution and recovery strategy? Yes, so I think the, the entire financial sector safety net collaborate. Um, so we've got different mechanisms in place for the sharing of information and collaboration in terms of, for example, uh, recovery plans as well as resolution plans for institutions. So Cody is part of some of the committees and structures and we provide our input. But it's also important for us just to remain updated as to the developments in the banking sector. You obviously know that the resolution framework is not just banks. It also includes other designated institutions, insurance as financial market infrastructure, whereas Cody focuses only on banks. Um, but we've got these structures in place in terms of collaboration, information sharing and coordination. And we just, you know, participate in these activities and we give our input. And I think that is just the way that it will continue for the next few years. There's also agreements between these different parties as to which roles each one fulfill um, and with what their specific focus is. Sabia, on a personal note, what does this mean for you, having been so instrumental in bringing Cody to fruition in the South African market? You know, it sounds like the work is just beginning, but I'm sure there must be uh, some sense of achievement that you've reached this moment. Yes, I, I have to say it's been very rewarding. I think when I started the work in 2013, I did not think it would take 11 years to get here. So Cody is becoming operational and uh, our launch was actually quite a, an achievement for me at a personal level. But I am excited. I believe in the purpose that Cody has in the market um, and I believe that it will make a difference in many people's lives in the unlikely event that a bank fails because we don't have many bank failures in South Africa and that we can always improve on what we've got. So maybe now Cody has 100,000 as a coverage level and we cover certain types of products. We've got certain types of members but it's something that will we'll expand in future. So I'm excited about all of the possibilities that it has for the public um, and also for the, the team at Cody. 
Fantastic. We're going to leave it there, uh, Sabir Mohammed. Thank you very much for sharing a little bit more about your background and journey in bringing Cody to fruition with us here on the Monocle Banking Podcast. We wish you everything of the best in our ironing out all of the creases and crinkles and things, natural teething issues that come with these things and expanding it into the future. Take care. Thank you, Michael. Well, that was Sabina Mohammed, the CEO of the new corporation for deposit insurance in South Africa, Cody. Fascinating that, isn't it? Uh, and obviously, South Africa's got a very resilient financial sector, but I think deposit insurance does bring further confidence and stability to our banks. In the past, when a bank failed, the government used taxpayer money to compensate affected depositors on a case-by-case basis. Now with deposit insurance, Qualifying depositors will be given reasonable access to their covered deposits should their bank fail through uh, Cody's use of the fund that we were discussing. Roughly 100 countries in the world have a deposit insurance similar to the one South Africa has now adopted. Well, you've been listening to the Monocle Banking Podcast this week, as always, brought to you by Monocle Solutions. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to the podcast. We'll be back with you next week. Take care.